Okay, welcome everybody. We're gonna have to do handheld mics here. Um, my apologies to the speakers in this session. Welcome to afternoon session number two, Northwest Stories, Health Development and Environmental Education in Prisons, which is not meaning everything is in prisons. That's just the last one. It's a little confusing to those of us who are presenting on non-prison stuff to read it that way. Um, my name is BJ Cummings. I'm the policy advisor with the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and have also been managing our community health um, programs for the last three years. Um, I'm actually a, a nominal presenter um, on the very first of the um, presentations in this session. And I would like to start by introducing my co-presenters. Um, our presentation is Duwamish Valley Cumulative Health Impact Analysis, Creating a Healthy, Sustainable Community. And our presenters, um, in addition to myself, are Paulina Lopez-Peters and Lynn Gould. Um, Paulina is a full-time volunteer organizer, advocate, and the mother of three boys under the age of 10. In other words, she's a Wonder Woman. I've seen this firsthand. <laughs> she originally comes from Ecuador, um, but has made Seattle her home over the past 10 years. Paulina demonstrates engagement in this community in the advocacy of multiple important civic policies in this area, including access to a safe, clean environment for our families. Presently, she works as the Community Engagement Manager for the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition Technical Advisory Group and serves as volunteer president of the South Park Information and Resource Center in the Duwamish Valley in South Seattle. Um, the South Park Information and Resource Center is a grassroots community organization which endeavors to foster civic engagement in recent immigrant lives with special focus on women. Paulina has labored extensively to promote local social and environmental justice issues uniquely affecting our recent immigrant communities, such as the cleanup of our Duwamish River, as well as health impact assessments. Um, presenting with her will be Lynn Gould. Lynn is the executive director of Just Health Action, a nonprofit organization in Seattle. JHA advocates for reducing health inequities that result from social, economic, environmental, and political conditions. Lynn conducts research and documents health inequalities in collaboration with community experts. She also develops curriculum and teaches workshops on health equity around the country in order to give individuals and communities the skills to take action on issues that affect them. Um, I am very briefly going to introduce this presentation and then um, retreat to my role as timekeeper um, for Paulina and Lynn. I just want to um, place what you're going to hear from them in a little bit of context for folks that may not be as familiar with cleanup efforts on the Duwamish River in South Seattle. Um, how many of you are, C are from Seattle? I know there are some people here from out of town. Okay, so about half of you. And how many of those that are from Seattle have actually visited the Duwamish? Mm, I think most of you who are from here have, which is terrific. Um, we often don't find that. We often find that about half the people in Seattle actually don't even know where the Duwamish is, if they know Seattle has a river at all. It is, um, it is hidden from most of Seattle, um, and we also like to refer to it as Seattle's dirty little secret because it doesn't really conform to Seattle's image of itself as a green city. Um, but you'll hear a little bit more about that as we go on. In, uh, in 2001, the Duwamish was listed by the Environmental Protection Agency as uh, a federal Superfund site. It was placed on the national priorities list, which essentially means that it was um, recognized or designated as one of the most toxic hazardous waste sites in the nation, um, and on the good side, also meant that it um, had to be cleaned up. So since 2001, Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition has been working as EPA's community advisory group and engaging the community in the process of advising EPA and helping to guide development of a cleanup plan for the river. Um, some early action hotspot cleanups um, have already and are currently um, occurring, areas that could not wait because they pose such a threat to the environment and human health. Um, but the river-wide cleanup plan went out for public review after 12 years in development, went out for public review last year, um, and a final decision will be made by EPA on the river cleanup by the end of this year. So we will soon know um, what the results of those many years of work will be. 
about midway through that process, um, as EPA's community advisory group, Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition, realized a need to go to the community, um, really engage deeply with the community, and find out what their overall vision, um, not just for the river, but for the whole Duwamish Valley is. People who live there, people who fish there, people who work there, people who played there. What is the long-term vision? So that we could help um, advise EPA on crafting a cleanup plan that facilitates the long-term vision for the place that people are live, work, living, working, and playing. Um, because there were some things that were happening where we realized the river cleanup decisions, specific things about it, could actually impede that long-term vision. So we worked with the community, and you'll hear a little bit more about this from Paulina, um, to identify what, uh, what the big, really big picture goal is for the Duwamish Valley. Um, and right at the core of that was, when this is all done, we want a healthy community. And they meant that in terms of the physical environment, they meant that in terms of the social environment, they meant that in terms of the economic environment, in terms of transportation links, um, when we want to make sure that the river cleanup is a catalyst for finally building a healthy community in the Duwamish Valley, um, which has not historically existed, as you'll hear more about. So um, with that context, um, Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition set out to start to put the ingredients together for um, building that healthy community. The community had identified information needs, so research had to be done in order to um, either document or discover um, things that the community either already knew or needed to know in order to start building a healthier community. Um, we also had to work on some policy issues, not just with EPA, but with our own local city and county governments. Um, and the community wanted to get started right away on some community level action that it could take even before the river cleanup began. Um, so we started a trio of projects to address those three areas. And what we're gonna be presenting on today is the research side. Uh, we conducted a cumulative health impacts analysis to help answer the community's questions or validate the community's knowledge, um, in some cases, about the state of health in the Duwamish Valley. So I'm gonna hand this over to um, Paulina to tell you a little bit more about how we went about this. Um, and then you'll hear from Lynn as to how um, information that the community gathered was used in a um, scientific way to um, document and uh, validate the information that was collected. Paulina. I'm so glad I can stand up. I was feeling uncomfortable sitting down. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as PJ introduced me, uh, my name is Paulina and Paulina Lopez. I live in South Park. So I am very familiar with everything that is being discussed. And in fact, um, the, fact that I am the, the fact that I'm here tells um, why I always got very interested in uh, being part of, of these, all these analysis of all this research because it impacts directly to my family, to my neighbors, and in fact, through all my community. So I started to get um, linked with the DRCC as a volunteer because it was, uh, for me, one of the reasons why uh, we started, we moved to South Park with my husband was we saw, you know, many people that spoke Spanish and we wanted to live in a place where my kids grew up and it's assimilate with the Spanish culture as well as the um, United States culture. But so we found that there and we found a beautiful river two blocks away from our house and we thought, wow, it's so lucky we can be here and a lot of people look like me. We can be close to the river, close to, uh, just like back home. So. Is it, to, it didn't take me that long to understand that even though the river is right there very beautifully, unfortunately, we cannot enjoy it. So that's uh, enjoy it fully, you know, when we have uh, to be concerned about pollution, to be concerned about be careful if my kids get wet in the mud, would they get contaminated and all the things like this. So I started to volunteer more. I wanted to understand um, how uh, we can as community help and do things differently. So um, I am gonna talk, be talking specifically about the mapping project that we did, but you know, first uh, it's good to put things in context. Uh, the Duwamish Valley has a community, lo mostly low income community, or people whose language is not English. And it's, um, by now you may understand that it has a lot of different um, needs and lacks. We have very high pollution in there, but also 
asthma rates are high. So we, um, as the DRCC, we wanted to understand from the community perspective, what does the community think or sees as healthy that is good for the community, and what do they see as the, some of the assets that they have? You know, not only the threats that yes, we are seeing all the industries around us and the air pollution that we receive, but also to um, understand how do I change this like this to understand. Okay. No, sorry, what's this? Down. There you go. Oh, keyboard. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Wait. Oh, there's That's something great. in there. Got him. Got him. Yeah, yeah, we know. There we go. All right. There you go. Um, so if you haven't been, you know, in, in, in South Park or in Georgetown and the Duwamish Valley area, we do also have a lot of assets. And uh, we, for instance, you know, have a um, wonderful set of art around the neighborhood. We do have a lot of youth, a lot of families, but youth is a, in a very big percentage. And I mentioned this because I will refer to some future. Um, we do have a big space that we call um, Mara Farm. Um, if you haven't visited, please come see it. And, you know, we, we, we do have this, but we wanted to recognize so we can build up on, on making it better or using these assets to make the community better. Um, so how would we want to identify this was, okay, many people who live in the neighborhoods that we wanted to get the feedback, um, it's very hard to fill out surveys, you know? It's very hard to explain the word environment for some people. The environment for me means my community, for others means the river, for others. So it's a green, it's a, it's a new concept, the green concept in our immigrant communities. So when we were doing the brainstorming and how do we get better and how do we get the better understanding how community sees, we wanna see what is uh, polluted and what is not polluted or what is uh, healthy. We want to give the opportunity for people to understand from the basics, like, okay, uh, it's not a survey that you're going to fill. I want you to show me exactly how do you see it um, as a, I'm already halfway. How do you see it as a healthy and unhealthy community? So we started um, to visit, to have these two different um, designs for the map. So we created a map that was, for example, the whole South Park, let's refer to them. And as we were discussing was, okay, people get more attached to expressing how they feel if they don't think first on the community overall, but if they think of specifically, you know, I see that my kids go to school, but there's this scary path over here. Is th this is ungrown bushes that it feels not safe for my kids. And it was a wonderful opportunity for us to see how people could express through the mapping exercise, especially identifying where they feel um, that the needs mostly are. So you see like the green things were like all the healthy things. And um, we visited many different places where usually people um, won't come to meetings, but we know that they will be there. So we had, we visited the food bank, the community centers, the library, and we explained and people got excited, not only to feel it like we wanted to feel the press about the neighborhood, like tell me what has been feeling healthy here, but also what is healthy in your community so people can have you know, a better understanding of what can we do as community, make it even better. So um, we had the, where is it your neighborhood healthy and unhealthy? And we did these exercises and surprisingly enough, we got almost 400 uh, feedback, so 400 different people uh, gave us some feedback to build upon what is it that we needed to do. Uh, several different workshops and people could draw because, you know, for some people didn't even, um, they don't know how to write, so they were drawing um, the potholes that we didn't know the word, we had to research it, but it was a hole in the street, so to explain it, people were just drawing and uh, we also um, were attending to different languages that we did the workshop, so we did a Spanish, Vietnamese, and we had some help for Cambodian as well, so it was a wonderful opportunity how for many people now, we were identified by seeing just a map and seeing my house and seeing how it affects directly to my, my home, my family. Um, then we did have um, 
also we wanted, as I said, I mentioned the youth because um, we have a big percentage of youth and we wanted to hear from their perspective. What do they think as a neighborhood? And we develop an internship opportunity through the summer. And what we did is um, uh, students learn how to also identify healthy and healthy. And they learn about environmental justice. But they went out. They wanted to take pictures of what it meant to them, the healthy and unhealthy of the communities. And it coincided a lot with the community overall set. But they reinforce it mostly in the lack of green spaces for, for them to exercise or to um, have some recreation. Oops. Um, something that I did wanted to mention is that because of doing all these exercises um, for the healthy uh, communities, help the community get together and design also, you know, to think of how, how are we doing as a community as far as like what are the things that we can improve. But they, there was also um, some of that part of like, how can we get it better? And that's something that I will refer in a bit after Lynn. So, Lynn? Thank you. Okay, so um, the thing that's so important, I, and uh, this is what we refer to as community based participatory research. Is everyone familiar with that terminology? Most of you. Okay, so um, basically, is that just for me or the whole thing? Okay, that's perfect. Um, so we, let me go to my next slide. Okay, so from a community-based participatory research point of view, we, uh, D DRCC and Just Health Action got an EPA environmental justice research grant to really show that, um, that, that this part, South Park and, and uh, Georgetown really, and the Duwamish Valley really is a community with environmental justice concerns because everyone's talked about it anecdotally, but no one would take any action because there wasn't any proof. So going to the community and finding out how, what, the, what indicators or what things concerned them um, was really important to us, and then we could build their concerns into the science of proving that this really is a community with environmental justice concerns. So um, we got this methodology from uh, Cal EPA Region Nine on you know how you make how you do a cumulative health impact analysis, and um, just imagine this. So just like I'm just going to use these pictures to tell you what we did in using science. So imagine you're a really rich white dude, you know. And you live in a really cool, expensive house, and you have your kids have this amazing playground, and you have an incredible viewscape, and you know you get this awesome place to go play, you know, and you can run around, and you don't have asthma. Plus, plus, plus. So imagine those type of cumulative impacts, you know, or imagine that maybe you know you work in um, the service industry like landscaping, and your house isn't so good; it's kind of run down. And you know you don't have such a good playground, and you live near air pollution, and you have asthma. Plus, plus, plus. So you can just imagine what type of health issues you might have, or other issues, you know, burdens you might have if you live in these two different types of neighborhoods. So our CHIA, we call it cumulative health impacts analysis. We had ten different zip codes that we looked at um, in Seattle, and they ranged. Um, we were looking at ranges of income, uh, percent minority, and then percent pollution. And then we use the CBPR, community-based participatory approach. And um, I'm going to show you a bunch of maps now, but I just, we looked, we had indicators. We had about 25 to 30 different indicators, but for this particular analysis, we had 15 indicators, so three indicators in each of these, five, each of these categories. So we had socioeconomic factors, and just look for brown maps. Then we have sensitive populations, green maps, um, environmental exposure factors or blue maps. Environmental effects is like the built environment. That'll be purple, and then public health. Okay, so just watch these, these, these maps. Okay, so this is socioeconomic factors, and this area right here is the Duwamish Valley, okay? Um, we had to aggregate by zip code, but just take a, just start watching everything, um, and watch how, where, where you see the Seattle that's light and dark. All right, ready? So then this is sensitive populations, percent foreign born by zip code. This is environmental exposure, so average diesel particulate matter. Here's number of toxic release inventory sites. 
Now this one I put into the environmental effects category because of the built environment. So I made this assumption that the more toxic release inventory sites you have, the, the worse your built environment looks. Okay, this is tr percent tree canopy. And this is asthma hospitalization rates. So you can imagine that if you have 25 maps like that, and they all just keep on going dark, 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 dark in certain part of you know, a zone, then you could then plug it into a formula. And this is the formula. The cumulative impacts equals the socioeconomic factors plus the sensitive population factors times the environmental exposure factors plus the environmental effect factors plus the public health factors. Okay, so this is what the cumulative health impacts map looks like. So on a range of, let's say, a hundred, a six is like a, a really, really good uh, community with very little, you know, kind of environmental impacts and lots of environmental assets. And then dark, the brown, goes up all the way to 120. So here we've got Beacon Hill, Georgetown, and South Park with, you know, a cumulative impact score of 106. But then we have our, you know, wealthy white communities, the yellow ones, um, with impact scores of around, you know, 13 to 21. All right, um, so the other thing that's really important is that we were only able to aggregate a lot of our data by zip code, and that's super problematic, as anyone who's in the um, GIS world will talk about. Um, but we were able to get down to the census tract for a couple of the indicators, and one is life expectancy at birth. And we had Georgetown South Park um, with a life expectancy of 73, and then Laurelhurst uh, census tract, which is, um, it's in the near the University of Washington. It's up in that top corner right there, and it's one of the wealthiest, richest communities, whitest communities in Seattle. And um, look, there was a 13-year difference in life expectancy. That's huge. I mean, and the way we describe this is: imagine, you know, if you're 13 years old and there's a 13-year difference in life expectancy, you might not have the option to get to know your father, or I mean, your grandfather. Um, heart disease death rate, the same thing, and she just cut me off, and it's perfect, because now I'm at Colleen's turn. Okay, so um, just uh, okay, catching up, you know, like after we've done uh, the mapping exercises, now we know what people uh, identified as healthy as unhealthy, then we started to do the prioritization workshops. Um, the RCC has always been strong in community input and community participation. So we wanted the community to prioritize. Okay, so we have 120 things, uh, different things that we, will, we wanna work on. What are we, our most important things that the community, as community members, we want to do? So we, we held this um, different workshops uh, around the Duwamish Valley area. And as an um, incentive, we provided the Duwamish dollar that we call it. And the community came and they liked it. They could um, access to the different uh, local restaurants and businesses. So they um, identified uh, all the different main areas where we wanted to, they wanted to be covered as community and the, the main issues that they wanted to address. And because of that, um, we were able to uh, form a group of community advisors as well. And all this data was who was being dr driven and the community action grants that right now are happening in that neighborhood. So we, um, one of the main things, for example, was access to healthy food. Uh, so we had, you know, the food bank applying as well. Uh, we had Myra Farm and the lack of green spaces so people can um, enjoy planting trees and also um, the different things with the rain gardens because people were concerned about um, all the different contamination and the water and all that. So they have been um, acting uh, uh, because of all the brainstorming that was at the community. So it was the data that helped to facilitate these grants. Anybody could talk about this? Oh, the pollution control, I guess. I, I could talk a little bit more. So we have uh, right now more than like 20 rain gardens and we see it as a perfect way to, you know, stop contaminating the, um, the river as well. But also because South Park, unfortunately, um, has a bad um, a case of flooding. So more and more community are being aware of how can we make this better. And as community, they identify this as having um, the brain gardens. So I would ask you to come and also visit and see it's, it's looking great in the neighborhood. Um, 
I think I'm done with this. Okay, we have just um, just a couple of moments for questions. I think these last remaining slides are just some of the other action projects that were done. Um, so if uh, Paulina and Lynn, are there any questions for Paulina and Lynn before they step down? Uh, I, I'll take that one if you don't mind, is that okay? <laughs> um, the Lower Duwamish um, River is a super fun site with 42 different chemicals in the sediment or the mud at the river bottom from over 100 different polluter sources. Um, and then in addition to that, we've got air pollution, soil pollution, there's a lot of other um, factors that went into this particular project. So it's not just the Superfund site itself, but even j if you just look at the river, it's, um, it's not a polluter, it's, it's well over 100. Questions for Paulina and Lynn? That's not, yeah. It's, yeah, it's spelled here. Use, use this one <laughs> or this one. Don't use this one. Sorry, Yeah, um, so it's been an ongoing process, and for this particular um, exercise, for the mapping exercise, is that what you're referring to? Any of the outreach. Okay, so yes. Um, it is very important uh, that the community understand first um, where the community is at. If they don't feel part of the community or they don't feel part of the process, they won't participate. So we had this visioning for this exercise, for example, is we, if we wanna create, if we had some funding that we can come up with better exercises, with, no, with better um, things for the community, with improvements, uh, who will decide? The organization that is working with them or the community? So it's always in starting from the bottom with the community, understanding, owning that project. And that's what we have always, and my uh, part and the support that the DHCC has always been, okay, where does the community want to start from? Um, do we need to identify first if we know exactly what is the community, uh, how is the community doing, what is that we have as an asset, uh, or do we need to start from the bottom? You know, we. Um, it's hard to attend meetings sometimes where you don't understand any of the subject. Like, if you are going to talk about, um, for example, different cleanup options, and it's hard to understand terminology. Um, so we have always given that priority to the community to understand how we better can explain, understand it from the bottom, so the community can participate at all levels. I can totally hear you about community fatigue, <laughs> um, especially when there's like in a, in a week, six or seven meetings to attend to talk about changes, you know, it's, I totally hear you. Uh, but I think things like this, for example, um, motivate again the community to see, okay, we were part of something, that we were part of the research, we give the opinion, but also because of this data, then great things are happening again in my community. So for example, many people that wanted to, they said, we don't have access to healthy communities. We don't have access to a park. Maybe we can grow our own organic food. And then they did that input. And because of that, the grant happened. So now we have a chicken coop in Mara Farm, or we have uh, you know, given some um, 
tree for money for trees for people to be part of like I wish we would have more green spaces here or you know a be part so I think it's very important always not just to gather the information from the community and take off and never come back but it's always important when the community you get the feedback you exercise it with them you get it and then you come back and with the community you decide how to start how to do it and then making sure people see it the results that they were part of so I want to be respectful of the other presenters' time, so I'm going to um, cut Paulina and Lynn off, um, and myself, and uh, ask the next presenter team, um, Troy and Jonah, to come up. But if we have time um, at the end of the session, um, and all the presenters can stick around, there uh, we may have time for some additional Q&A. Um, and of course, you can grab them when the session is done as well. Thank you. Just until he gets set up, a quick announcement. If you want to see South Park and the community and see more of it, we have our The Wamish River Festival coming on the 23rd. So you're all welcome to come from 12 to 4, and it was a great opportunity. Just kind of also an answer to the question, right? Make sure people have fun while they work to improve their environment. <laughs> OK, um, I am going to do a quick introduction here for our next team. The next presentation is Gentrified Sustainability, Inequitable Development, and Seattle's Riskscape, which is a word I love. Um, our presenters are uh, Troy Abel and Jonah White. Troy Abel is Associate Professor and Academic Programs Director at Huxley College of the Environment Peninsula's <laughs> program at Western Washington University. Uh, Dr. Abel's teaching and research interests focus on the dynamic tensions of environmental science and democratic politics in a variety of arenas, including climate risk governance, environmental justice, and political biogeography. Um, Jonah White is on my laptop, or on Troy's laptop, I should say, uh, as a geography instructor and research assistant. And I'm going to let him introduce himself um, because the uh, laptop went dead. Do <laughs> you want to say a word about your research? OK, I'll let, I'll let you do it when you come up. So um, please welcome Troy and Jonah. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm uh, Professor Abel. This is Jonah White. And uh, um, a little bit of context that will help us uh, actually introduce Jonah. We both came to the Northwest in 2006, and he was one of our geography graduate students. And his uh, research and teaching uh, focuses on physical and human geography and the contradictions of urban development and planning, gentrification, and inequitable development. We're both from the Midwest, and when we arrived, um, actually in Bellingham, um, I was already doing some environmental justice research, well, actually environmental injustice research um, in uh, St. Louis, and I learned about Jonah's thesis project, which was gonna focus on gentrification in Seattle. So I approached his advisor, Professor Deb Mukherjee, and said, you know, there may be some intersection here between environmental injustice and gentrification, and perhaps Seattle will be a, a case for us to explore that. So we kind of were up there in Bellingham and uh, launched into this project, and today we're gonna share the latest iteration um, of our joint project. So we're gonna talk about some, some fundamental concepts, uh, including an equitable development, uh, a little bit about the skewed risk scape, and then we would like to uh, make a few policy prescriptions. Since my PhD is in public policy, I can never resist that kind of opportunity. So uh, the EPA has consistently defined environmental justice, and I'll just highlight fair treatment and, and meaningful involvement. And of course, the opposite of that is unfair treatment and meaningless involvement, as my uh, students will often observe, and so I think it's important to, to uh, start there with that concept. And recently, in a, um, some draft 
technical guidance for regulatory riders in April 2013. The EPA actually, there's a lot going on on this slide, but if you just focus at the last sentence um, in this paragraph, that social context and social stratification together can shape determinants of health, such as material circumstances, neighborhood and housing conditions and quality. And this is really where our research comes in. Uh, we're absolutely impressed and congratulations uh, to the Duwamish team and Just Health Action and Paulina and the communities for doing the CHIA, uh, but also for doing uh, engagement in the community. Um, and so we're honored to, to really share the stage um, and share our perspective on this. But so EPA is beginning to understand the social stratification as an important um, issue that has to be addressed to deal with fairer treatment and more meaningful involvement. Now, another important concept that we draw on is inequitable de development, excuse me, the emergence and growth of economically and socially divided communities. And one of my colleagues at the EPA, Carlton Ely, has this in his email, and I got his permission to use it. You shouldn't have to be rich to enjoy the riches of the environment, built or natural. And that would be equitable development, right? So those are really incredible concepts. Now, how many of you have seen the really pretty Venn diagram of sustainability where the three circles come together, right? And in the center is that really wonderful kumbaya place where sustainability happens, right? Have, has anybody ever been to that place, by the way? <laughs> I'm curious, in your head, right? Well, so let's flip the script a little bit. And since we're kind of from the academic world and we like to um, be fairly critical, uh, we just aren't even going to put that on the table. And instead, we draw from this version of sustainability, which is not actually a Venn diagram, it's a triangle. Uh, Scott Campbell called it the planner's triangle. And we think appropriately recognize that uh, sustainability is a utopian place, idea, concept. It's an important one to continue to talk about. But the reality, and I think you'll, you're already getting a taste of that reality in South Seattle, is that there are all kinds of conflicts in an urban landscape, in urban communities, um, and in the risk scape. And so on this graphic, what our research has really begun to focus on is the tension between equity at the top and economic growth, which Campbell very um, cleverly calls the property conflict. And this is where gentrification comes into our research very importantly. The second leg that we focus on is the development conflict between equity and environmental protection. And so we use this framework, and I encourage especially those students out there uh, beginning to enter into this um, area of, of research um, to look up and think very carefully about Campbell's reaction to sustainability. Uh, these are our hypotheses about what we would expect to find in Seattle. And again, remember, we're up in Bellingham in 2006, imagining this concept. Uh, we had been to Seattle a couple times. Actually, I had been on the toxic tour that you used to run on the Duwamish River, uh, probably in 2006. Uh, and I, I remember a dead seal very vividly floating in the Duwamish River. So um, I had visited the community, but I, again, I have this kind of academic view, as uh, really Jonah does as well. So um, I won't read these. I presume you, you got to look at those. But if we um, think about the concept of inequitable development, let's see how that empirically looks. Um, I always like this uh, photograph because um, this was a little... Um, slogan that the Tourism Board of Seattle had for a while, Metro Natural, about five years, I think. 
And um, an important confession, I now live in Seattle. This is Belltown. This is my apartment building. So I do have a, uh, an important confession to make. I do live in Seattle, uh, but I continue to enjoy being engaged in this work and, and to be critical of uh, what's going on in Seattle. So uh, I do want to give a, an important shout out to my collaborator and, and co-author, Jonah. Um, he is responsible for much of the demographic analysis. Lynn talked about the limitations of zip codes as your scale. Uh, Jonah has done some amazing work with census block group data. And we've also, with the support of Western Washington University, been able to buy longitudinal census track data, or excuse me, census block group data in uh, the spatial boundaries of 2000. So it allows us to compare trends across time. There are limits with this particular quantitative choices, and you can read more about them in our paper. But essentially, um, Jonah has uh, done some amazing, what's called factorial social ecology, and it goes all the way back to the 1950s um, in urban geography, to really look at how um, clusters in a city form, that is, these are clusters where a selection of variables are most similar within a geographic unit, but most dissimilar beyond the geographic unit. So it's a way kind of to sort out what might be going on in a community. And there's principal components analysis, a lot of statistics, um, a lot of beating on computers in the spatial lab, right, Jonah? And um, we pretty consistently come uh, or the statistics lead us to about 15 clusters. And then going to the theory, we organize those 15 clusters into five kinds of trajectories. So uh, we'll just focus on the three gentrification trajectories, and that's replacement gentrification, which are clusters one, five, and six. And by the way, these are two different time periods. And you see the longer time period, the clusters don't hold as, as tightly together as when you only do between two census. Um, but then you have core redevelopment gentrification, cluster nine and 10 here, and then displacement gentrification. These view sheds are a good example of those um, happening in Seattle. So it's really important to understand this kind of development context in Seattle because of the property conflict, right? At your wealth um, and your accumulated wealth and other community resources give you access to certain kinds of things and, and limits your access in, in other conditions. So uh, these are the, the first two that are not gentrification and uh, I'm gonna skip that and get to the uh, replacement gentrification uh, clusters and core redevelopment. So these are some of the descriptors. And, and so, for instance, uh, a replacement gentrification cluster, cluster number five, increased social status, above average incomes, young, non-families, above average home values, primarily renters. Just one example of our gentrification categories. Now, like in the previous presentation, to focus on um, Georgetown and South Park, and I'll go back up real quickly, right? You remember the, we're really talking about what effectively is cluster 15 in both of these graphics, and it syncs up very nicely with the Chia, I think. Uh, but if you look across the decades, 80, 90, 2000 to 2009, you see some trends. Uh, cluster 15 goes from majority white to majority non-white, but then it's reversing in 2009. And over in percent, percent black, it actually increased between 90 and 2000, and then it decreased again. So some interesting trends. And uh, at the beginning, of this analysis, uh, we chose these particular demographics because these were the predominant non-white groups in, or these are the predominant racial groups 
in Seattle, white, black, Asian. We're not gonna show you the trends for percent Asian, and we don't, and we have not considered percent Hispanic, because that's a relatively new influx into Seattle, and I think we're obviously learning and understanding that that's something we need to consider in the future. But here's some other um, statistics, and, and we, we've got a wealth of these, and we're happy to share our papers with you. But if you look at median household income, it's actually fairly close to the average for Seattle, right? But look at some of those other median house values across the city, and you see an incredible amount of variation, right? So what's, what's going on as Seattle deindustrializes, becomes a post-industrial destination world city, the benefits of its development trajectory is uneven. It's skewed. It's skewed to particular places. So there are folks, there are communities benefiting a great deal more from development in city than others. But what really stands out when you look at um, the demographics is education attainment and professional managerial occupations. And actually, not just cluster 15, but cluster 13, 14, and 15. Really, all of South Seattle is a working class um, community that's very, very different than what I experience on a regular basis, let's say in Belltown, right? Um, I'm now dealing with about 8,000 interns in my neighborhood from Amazon. Uh, it's a very different world. And, uh, and as I, I like what you said, BJ, it's a, an invisible world because it, it doesn't match with Seattle's image of itself. Well, most of Seattle's image of itself. And I think it's really important to understand the diversity we have in Seattle, to recognize it. Um, and this kind of analysis maybe begins to reveal that. So. Um, now to focus on the development conflict, Campbell actually says in, uh, actually environmental racism is at the center of the development conflict between equity and ecology. And really the, a kind of institutional racism that has long driven um, the institutions that deal with environmental protection. So what I'm gonna do here is, is do our kind of animation. Um, so I want everybody in the audience to really focus we're gonna show you two maps with two different decades, but focus on the left-hand side. And we're gonna see over three decades is the deindustrialization of Seattle. And those dots represent toxic release inventory facilities. Uh, so we only look at a very small part of the risk scape. There's a much richer detail of the risk scape in the CHIA that we've already learned about. Um, the size of those dots reflect an, um, the risk of those different facilities. So you can see the, and we put the risk scores up there in the legend between zero to one, and, and I can talk more after the presentation about what EPA um, simulations we use to calculate those risks. These are from air toxic uh, releases only. So do you see what happens? Now we're in 2009. Let me go backwards, forwards. So Seattle is definitely deindustrialized. Um, there's clearly more risk on this in South Seattle at the beginning of our time period in 1990. Uh, in 2000, arguably, um, it distributes a little bit more evenly and then as it continues to deindustrialize, it again concentrates in South Seattle with a few really uh, potentially risky air polluters. Now, going back uh, to talk about one more map, this is a dichotomy of gentrified and non-gentrified areas of Seattle, and the triangles are facilities that did not exist in 1990. So these are new facilities that have located or become reporters in the EPA system. There were 56 facilities that, that came into Seattle or came into the regulatory 
arena of the EPA's TRI program, 36 of them are in non-gentrifying areas. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why. You know, uh, Georgetown and South Park are, of, of course, in a big area of Seattle that's zoned industrial, uh, but uh, we think we've got a longitudinal look at how actually environmental inequality has been forming and, and shifting in the Seattle, in Seattle. Now, I'll just quickly say, I know BJ's coming to cut me off, and, and I appreciate that. I want to respect our other uh, presenters. But not all pollution is created equally. And this is a, a couple of tables of all the different facilities and their pounds, but the risk values. And uh, chromium compounds um, are simulated as incredibly risky air emissions, as they should be. And you can see one particular facility um, in one of our maps that we've produced. Uh, sound propeller services in two different, they were on Lake Union and now they have operations in, in South Seattle. So now to, to kind of bring this to a close, as BJ uh, approaches, <laughs> focused air pollution monitoring. I know we've got some EPA folks in the room um, and I don't know if this is an opportune time to talk about our collaboratives. That's going to be happening. More pollution prevention and source reduction. One of the things about these screening techniques is we can look at an entire region and really begin to prioritize where the worst risks are. Let's um, actually monitor them because we're only dealing with simulations. And then let's help them with source reduction. More cumulative health risk assessments. We need more CHIAs and we need it more democratically as well. And I think we saw a really good model of that today. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. If anyone has questions for Troy and Jonah, who's speaking off, are there any questions? Rashad. Uh, it, it was our study area. We, we agree. We should be doing King County and in our, in our next iteration we will be looking at King County and what's happening because really um, most of the diversity, the non-white immigrants that are coming into this region are not, they can't afford to come into this city, right? And there's a lot more industri industrial activity outside of the city as well. So you're absolutely right. Any other questions? Okay, well then I will um, actually, Troy opened the door just a little bit, so I will mention um, that uh, based on our mutual respect for each other's work, uh, Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and uh, Western Washington via Troy um, are gonna be undertaking a um, very significant air pollution um, exposure reduction project uh, over the next two years. So uh, starting now or last month <laughs> um, and extending for the next two years, we're gonna be focusing on um, assisting with identifying breaking exposure pathways and um, ultimately reducing air pollution sources throughout the Duwamish Valley. So that's the next step to look forward to on our two projects. Thank you. Okay, we have um, another one more presenter in this session. 
uh, environmental education in prison, a comparison of teaching methods and their influence on inmate attitudes and knowledge of environmental topics. Um, our presenter is Tiffany Webb, who is currently a graduate candidate in the Master of Environmental Studies program at the Evergreen State College. She works with the Sustainability in Prisons Project, coordinating a monthly science and sustainability lecture series for incarcerated men and women. Um, Tiffany received her BS uh, in Earth System Science from the University of Alabama in Huntsville, where she studied climate change research with various governmental organizations and NGOs, including NASA and Catholic, did I get Catholic? Uh, while her undergraduate work focused on international climate vulnerability, campus sustainability, and ecological impacts of agricultural systems, she is now dedicated to work in environmental and social justice. So um, Tiffany, will you come on up? Please welcome Tiffany Webb. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, good. This is my first time presenting on, in an auditorium, so I'm kind of excited about that. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, you've kind of covered my position and everything, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Sarah Weber, who was an MES grad student um, and former Oregon Spotted Frog Program Coordinator with the Sustainability in Prisons Project. Um, unfortunately, she was unable to attend today, so I'll be presenting for her. Um, the pre this presentation is on adult environmental education in the prison system and whether lecture or workshop style classes prove more beneficial um, in effectively teaching environmental topics to inmates. The research was conducted by Sarah Weber in collaboration with the Sustainability in Prisons Project during her time as a graduate student assistant. So the Sustainability in Prisons Project, or SPP, is a partnership between the Evergreen State College and the Washington Department of Corrections. And in the past five years, with the help of an NSF grant um, to expand the network, the SPP model has, ex has reached beyond Washington to include other states and counties across the US. Overall, the Sustainability in Prisons Project aims to reduce the risk of recidivism while creating a more humane environment for those in prison. Uh, the mission includes bringing science and nature into prisons, forging collaborations with scientists, inmates, and community partners, and reducing the environmental, economic, and human cost of prisons. Some of our areas of programming include sustainable operations, research and conservation, community, community contributions, and training and education. One of the longest running education programs we offer is the Science and Sustainability Lecture Series, which I coordinate currently. Through this program, we've reached over 3,000 inmates and Department of Corrections staff, nearly 200 scientists and sustainability expert presenters, and have hosted more than 150 lectures in prisons across Washington State. Even though inmates are not required to attend the lecture series, the classes are consistently full, attendees are always eager about the presentations, and they often express gratitude and contribute ideas for future lecture topics. The lecture series is offered monthly at two Washington prisons, and over the years, this has expanded to include occasional lectures and workshops um, at other facilities as requested. Through this educational program, we reach inmates at both men's and women's facilities, often through lectures, but occasionally through workshops too. Determining whether lectures or workshop style classes are more productive for the inmates could enhance how SPP conducts the educational aspect of our programs in prisons. In addition, understanding how to reach adult audiences with environmental topics may influence the broader field of environmental education. So within this research, Sarah Weber's main research questions were, are lectures or workshops more effective in improving inmates' knowledge and attitude regarding environmental topics? And is there a difference in teaching and learning needs between male and female uh, inmate populations? And these are all photographs from our programs in the prisons. The study used uh, mixed methodologies to measure the knowledge base of participating inmates. 
For a quantitative analysis, we designed pre and post engagement surveys using a five point Likert scale. An example of that is at the top, and if you've taken a survey, you're probably familiar with it. Um, and this Likert scale uh, is an, an attitudinal scale that measures the degree to which a respondent agrees with a statement. And some of the examples of the statements included on our surveys are above. The surveys contained 15 questions total that were repetitive from pre to post engagement surveys, as well as four additional open-ended post engagement questions from which we gathered our qualitative data. The study took place at two prisons in Washington, Mission Creek Correction Center for Women in Belfair and Cedar Creek Correction Center for Men in Little Rock. The, select the selected prisons are minimum security work camp style facilities in which inmates participate in various on and off site jobs and will be released into the workforce within five years. The lectures and workshops were co-presented by graduate student Sarah Weber and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife senior research scientist and Oregon spotted frog specialist Dr. Mark Hayes. Both lectures and workshops combine policy and science through discussion of political listings of the endangered Oregon spotted frog, the many contributions to its population decline, and conservation efforts being made towards reviving populations. We hypothesized that workshops and lectures would differently influence inmate learning, and that male and female students might differ in their preferred learning methods. Overall, using all quantitative data, we found that both types of environmental engagement resulted in average increases in content knowledge. And you can see this graph to the right, which shows uh, the content score improvements. And obviously, both lecture and workshop and male and female students increased. And I'll talk about some of the differences, too. Overall, gender was a significant influence on content knowledge scores, with female scores increasing more drastically than male scores. And you can see this by comparing the t-values. In addition, lecture scores were significantly higher than workshop scores overall. And we also found that female and male students responded differently to the two types of environmental engagement. These two factors, uh, engagement style and gender, showed a significant interaction. Uh, female students show more dramatic content score improvement following workshops, and male students increase more following lectures. Additionally, using multivariate analysis, we can show that there is a significant improvement in inmate attitudes and knowledge after receiving an educational opportunity. Be it lecture or workshop, male or female, the, the participants learn from the educational experience that they were offered. This is a non-metric, multidimensional scaling ordination, which shows every participating inmate's responses prior to and after receiving a presentation. Each gray triangle represents an, an individual's pre-presentation attitudes and knowledge, and each black triangle represents an individual's post-presentation attitudes and knowledge. Pre- and post-engagement scores are connected by a line for each individual, and symbols that are closer together in space are more similar to each other. So you can see that general trend of the scattered pre-engagement knowledge and attitudes converging to show more similar experiences post-engagement. And then this is the, a similar sort of ordination, uh, except for with the two uh, divided into lecture and workshop to see those, those compared. But again, we showed um, a similar shift in those two. To follow this, we checked all the pre-scores to see um, if this difference came from pre-existing attitudes and knowledge, but we found no powder. No pattern, um, and you can see no pattern in our image. Uh, Pre-survey results by type proved non-significant, meaning that there was no difference between individuals before receiving the lecture or workshops uh, presentations. This tells us that participating inmates came into their presentation with a variety of attitudes and knowledge. In contrast, Post-engagement survey responses did differ by presentation type, showing that lectures and workshops might influence attitudes and content knowledge differently overall. And you can see those groupings of the workshops um, on the bottom and the lectures on the top. Additionally, all responses to open-ended questions were transcribed and coded. You can see the words used most frequently by inmates in the wordle here. 
<laughs> the responses showed a resounding enthusiasm towards the topic presented, as well as to the environment, science, and learning how to improve their natural surroundings, both within and once outside of prison. The large yes shown in the Wordle is an answer to question four that asks, does the content presented inspire interest and or action towards environmental stewardship? And overall, the encouraging answer to that question was yes. We coded words synonymous with learning, environment, interest, and conservation, and tallied the numbers of times those words were used in open-ended responses. You can see those counts at the bottom. The numbers are very similar between the two presentation styles, which suggests that communication of content remained consistent throughout both presentations. With the results, the, the researchers suggested that SPP continue their educational offerings in prisons with a focus on the lecture style presentations in men's facilities and workshop style presentations at women's facilities. Future work could include a more expansive study with larger sample sizes and further examination of the demographics, age, and education level of those participating in the lecture series. And just something kind of anecdotal from my experience with the lecture series before I even read Sarah's research. Um, I've hosted both lectures and workshops in men's and women's facilities, and I've seen this sort of trend that she explained in her research uh, firsthand, where, for example, one of the questions on our post survey is, how could you improve this lecture? And uh, at the men's facility, sometimes there were comments like, less idiots in the class, and those sorts of things that were kind of demeaning to their peers. Um, I never saw that on any of the women's surveys. Um, and I've also seen more interaction and trust between the women when they're working in groups than I did see at the men's facility. So I thought that was really interesting to witness and then follow it up with her research. So, Although there are not many um, environmental education opportunities in prisons yet, STP is helping prove that there's a desire and a need for such opportunities for inmates and for the prison facilities alike. Inmates come to SPP presentations with a hunger for science education. We're able to reach demographics that are often underrepresented in the scientific community. We're able to introduce those who have limited educational backgrounds to scientific ideas and in some cases engage them in on-site conservation projects. This is valuable outreach to prison communities that don't receive much in the way of science and nature exposure. Importantly, most of the inmates will have an opportunity to create a life outside of prison and hopefully they'll have knowledge and ex experience that will enable them to be successful in their communities and to also be environmental stewards. Um, I'd like to personally thank Sarah Weber for allowing me the opportunity to present on her behalf today and also um, the opportunity to help her along the way with uh, publishing this research. Uh, the lecture series and evaluation is ongoing. We've expanded since the time of her research um, and to offer far more lectures at different facilities and to really cater to the needs of the inmates uh, that participate in them. So I'm happy to see that her research um, has really helped out with SPP and the development of our programs. Thank you. So the, can yes, okay. Um, so the topics vary with each lecture. Um, I kind of have free reign, and one of the questions on the post survey is uh, what, what topics would you be interested in seeing in the future? So I usually base the lectures on what is requested from the inmates. Um, but I'd love to do environmental justice presentations because I know it was something I wasn't really exposed to um, early on, and I don't know how many of the people that we work with um, have that sort of background. So I'm always looking for new presenters, <laughs> if anyone is interested. Um, we've presented on climate change, ocean acidification topics, um, really hard natural sciences, and we've also presented on the social sustainability behind things like yoga and that sort of thing. So it's really, it's really broad. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't necessarily count as a point about, yeah. you know, if, you, if you're 
just present it. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that insight. And just to kind of, I noticed the other two presentations were connected, and this is kind of random, but the majority of people who are incarcerated in the U.S. come from these sorts of communities that you guys were just talking about. So I think it does have a really important connection there. That's a really great idea. Yeah, that's a really great idea. Um, we are just now in the process of publishing this research, um, but I can definitely talk to the other people in SPP and see if there's any way for us to just share this document um, and our knowledge. Um, I. I know that we've had a lot of success because we're kind of in a, a partnership. Um, the Department of Corrections and Evergreen State College are in charge of this, this project. So in that, in that capacity, we have a lot of DOC support for our programmings, but they're not always on the same page, um, especially culturally. So um, those are just kind of some things to keep in mind. But yeah, I think it's a great idea to present them with us to explore other educational programs and the way that they're teaching them in Department of Corrections. Any other questions, or is that, am I on time? Yes. I think you were the only one who stuck to the original 15 yes. minutes, thank okay, you. Good. Which is actually, I practiced it. <laughs> which is actually great because um, we did have to, I think we had to cut off a couple questions earlier. So if there are any other questions for Tiffany or if there are questions um, still out there for the uh, presenters in the previous two, um, Troy and Jonah or Lynn and Paulina or myself, um, we have a few minutes left and you can bring those up now. Yes. Paulina, do you want to come back up and talk about some specifics? Because I could, but given that you are the one to do much of it, I think it would be <laughs> richer coming from you. Uh, you can, or you can, I mean, you, yeah, I think we can be pretty informal. Um, so how do we get people to the meetings? It has always been a, a puzzle question. Um, there's, I think, um, I mentioned this, but one of the things that are important for people, the meetings at the time that is convenient for families, you know? No, if you do a meeting in the middle of the day, nobody could be there. Um, obviously, childcare. Um, the meetings go even better if their own language is spoken instead of, as opposed to, it's very important to have interpreters, but sometimes better if it's spoken in the same languages. And incentives, dinner. People are always hungry. <laughs> uh, something that, for, ex for instance, worked really well for the mapping exercise was um, we applied to a grant that where people could get um, the Wamish dollars that I was referring to, so people can get um, to go to def um, use them. They were five dollars. Use them to a local shop or a local uh, restaurant, and we wanted to also incentive that you know from the local community to go and there. So people liked doing that. Now in this case, also you don't have to make them come to the meeting. You go to them. So that's why I mentioned food banks, libraries, and sometimes you have to invest a lot of time in different areas, but. Uh, the concept of meetings is something that is growing in us and the immigrant community. We just, you know, well, it's um, consensus. And it's that we have to uh, be part of processes rather than meetings only. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to build on that just a little bit. Um, we try not to have meetings, frankly. Um, sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's a formal EPA hearing, for example. And while we certainly um, work with EPA and push EPA out of its comfort zone in terms of how they um, might hold a formal public hearing, 
um, for the most part, whenever possible, we don't hold a meet meeting, we hold an event. So yes, food always, you know, yes, childcare if people need it, transportation if people need it. So all of the um, services that might be required in order to permit somebody who would want to come to an event, we need, we need to make sure to be able to provide. Um, the incentives are not just incentives to get there, whether it's five Duwamish dollars or a stipend for our community advisors that have to come to a meeting once every month. It's not just about incentive, it's about respecting people's time, right, and, and compensating that accordingly. Um, but I think, you know, you said uh, people like to come because of certain things. That's really what it's about. How do we make an event that is rich for the whole family, everybody that needs to participate in order for a single family member to participate? How do we create an event that's as much fun as it is work? You know, so how do we really do that in a way where people can contribute and become part of the fabric of their community without it being something that takes time out of their day otherwise? So we, you, we had a presentation earlier today all about different ways in which we use the arts to do that, for example. So we may have, um, we may have an event where there's you know, a dance performance and we collect information you know, through a table at the, beginning, you know, at the front door for a survey that we're doing. So any number of things and every single time it's different um, because we're needing to meet different goals and objectives. Um, but basically we try to make sure that we're creating a community event rather than holding a meeting. Any other questions for any of the other presenters? Great, well thank you all so much for coming to this session, appreciate it, and um, folks will be around for a few minutes if you just wanna talk one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you.